Okay, here we're going to take a look at standard 2.8, which is all about viruses. So in this standard, we're going to compare and contrast a virus and a cell, looking at it in terms of genetic material and um, how they reproduce. So you'll be able to describe the structure of a virus. You'll describe how viruses will use cells for reproduction. We're going to look at two different ways that they do this. Um, so here's some of the essential vocabulary that we are going to be taking a look at here, specifically the lytic and lysogenic cycles um, in terms of how viruses are going to reproduce. So what is a virus? Well, a virus is actually a type of parasite. A parasite is something that is going to harm a living thing while benefiting from that living thing. So they're going to live inside something and they're going to cause harm to it, but in the, while doing that, they are going to get benefits from it. So a virus is a particle of nucleic acid and protein that has to infect a host cell in order to replicate and make copies of itself. Uh, viruses cannot reproduce on their own, so they have to infect other cells in order to do this. The host cell is the cell that is actually going to get infected and eventually destroyed by the virus. So viruses um, basically attack certain host cells, go in there and make copies of themselves, and then once they've made enough copies, they destroy the cell. So the general structure of a virus, all viruses have DNA or RNA on the inside of them. So they have some kind of nucleic acid, um, but it could be DNA or it could be RNA. Um, around that DNA or RNA is a shell of protein that is called the capsid, and that um, basically gives the outer structure of the virus kind of like a cell wall. Um, and we can classify our viruses based on the type of nucleic acid that they contain. So if a virus has DNA inside of it, um, we call it a DNA virus. An example of this is the herpes simplex virus. Um, if it has RNA on the inside, then it's called um, an RNA virus. So an example is influenza, which causes the flu that people get every year. And then there's a third category that are actually called retroviruses. An example of this is HIV. And so I'll talk a little bit more detail in a minute about what retroviruses do, because they kind of infect things, um, living cells, in a different way. So let's first take a look at an example of a DNA virus. Herpes simplex virus is a DNA virus. So this causes like cold sores on people. Um, and basically, the outer envelope of it is your protein with the capsid in here, and then on the inside of it, you're going to have um, DNA. Um, so this virus has a very distinct shape to it, and as we look at all the different viruses, one thing that we can notice is that they all have um, very unique shapes to them, and those shapes are actually gonna help to determine what cells they can infect and the way that they infect them. So an RNA virus is influenza. So this is what an RNA virus might look like. So here in this drawing, you have your outer shell here. That's the capsid made of protein. And then inside, you have your RNA. Um, and this is what a, um, a picture of it under an electron microscope would look like. So if you look here, this is saying this is 100 nanometers. So they're smaller than 100 nanometers. So they're extremely, extremely small. Um, little particles. And that's basically what they are, particles of protein and nucleic acid. Um, so in basic terms, looking at virus structure, all viruses have two parts to them. So these are just a couple of different viruses that exist. Again, notice that they are all different kinds of shapes, but all of them are going to have a capsid on the outside. And remember that capsid is made of protein. And then on the inside, you're going to have um, one of the two types of nucleic acids. So the T4 bacteriophage, which will infect bacteria, has DNA on the inside. The tobacco mosaic virus, which actually does infect tobacco plants, is an RNA virus, so it has RNA on the inside. And then the outer capsid looks like um, this column or a cylinder. And then influenza virus, another RNA virus, is circular in shape. Um, but again, it's got a capsid, and it's got its RNA on the inside. And then a lot of times there are other structures that are going to be involved um, with how the virus is actually going to attach to and then attack the cell. So there are two basic ways that a um, virus can um, attack a cell. So um, we're going to take a look at these two different um, ways that this can happen. So we're actually going to kind of take a, a different view of this. So in the lytic viral cycle, the first thing that happens is the virus is going to attach to the cell wall or membrane of the cell. 
So if we look at um, the next slide, we can see that. So here is this little tiny bacteriophage right here, and it is attaching to the outside of this bacterial cell. Okay, so there's the little tiny virus. You can see how much smaller it is than even a small bacterium. So it just attaches to the outside. Step two, the virus is going to inject its DNA or RNA into that host cell. So the virus has that protein shell on the outside of it. Um, and then the DNA or RNA is on the inside. And it actually is just going to inject that little piece of DNA or RNA into it. The rest of the virus stays on the outside. The next step is the virus is actually going to take over control of the cell and it's going to make lots and lots of viral DNA and proteins. Um, so basically that viral DNA gets inside the cell and it actually hijacks the cell and starts using the cell's machinery like all of its ribosomes and everything to make its own DNA and proteins. So in step three you can see you've got a bunch of little viral DNA pieces and a bunch of little pieces of proteins. In step four, new virus particles are going to get assembled inside of the cell. So again, the virus is going to um, use the cell in order to make more copies of itself. So here you can see you now have a cell that is full of a bunch of different um, of these viruses. So all the little pieces got assembled into complete viruses. And in the last step, all the new viruses are going to eventually break open the cell wall or membrane, and they're going to destroy the cell in that process. When they do that, they're going to get released out into the environment, so if it's in your body, out into your blood, and they can go and find more cells to infect, and they will complete the cycle again. So it's the destroying of the cells that oftentimes is going to make people get really sick and cause them serious problems. Um, so if you look at this step five, here you've, the cell has gotten full of its viruses, so then they break open and now they're going to get released and they can go and find another cell and they will attach to it and they will do this whole cycle all over again. Now the other type of cycle that cells can use is called the lysogenic cycle. The lysogenic cycle is a little bit different. It starts out the same way. The virus is going to inject its DNA into the host cell, so the same way that it just did. Okay, so let's take a look at a picture of that. So here is our little virus, and it's injecting its DNA into the host cell once again. Okay, um, and so now that virus piece of DNA is there, and there is the bacterial piece of DNA. What is different, what happens now, is the viral DNA actually becomes part of the host cell's DNA. So it's going to actually go in and actually become a piece of the host cell's DNA. So if you look down here in step two, you can see that here the blue is the bacteria's DNA, and then this little piece of pink, that's the virus's DNA. So it's actually become part of the bacterium. What this allows the virus to do is as the host cell replicates its own DNA, it's also replicating the viral DNA. And these cells can do this for many generations. So as the cell's going about doing its own business, it's also making copies of the virus at the same time. Okay, So here you can see we are making copies of that particular virus with the DNA and that keeps happening and that can happen for generation after generation. Now eventually the cell is going to get triggered to start making the viruses and at this point we're going to enter into the lytic cycle. So the host cell will eventually start to make viral DNA and proteins just like it did in the lytic cycle. Um, and then we will eventually end up destroying the cell because those viruses will want to get released. Um, a virus that does this um, in the body is actually the um, herpes virus. Is, has the ability to do this. It's a DNA virus. And it goes in and actually becomes part of your own DNA. Um, and it will live inside of your cells forever. So that's why once you get start getting cold sores, you can have them for the rest of your life because they're living there in part of your DNA. And every once in a while during a time when you're sick or stressed or something, your body starts making the viruses and the viruses will eventually burst open the cells and that's when you get the cold sore or you know whatever the problem might be. Um, and then those cells, or those new viruses that were made are now free to go and find more cells and infect them and the cycle continues. Okay, so now we're going to get back into the actual slide style. Um, so the retroviruses are a unique type of virus. They do things a little bit differently. So some viruses inject RNA into the host cell. So they're, gonna, they're an RNA virus and they put RNA in. But that RNA is then converted back into DNA. Um, 
and then the virus will go into the lysogenic cycle. So they're an RNA virus, but once the RNA gets inside the cell, the RNA becomes DNA, and then we go into the lysogenic cycle and that DNA becomes part of the host cell. HIV, which is the virus that causes AIDS, is a retrovirus, and it's um, very difficult to, to uh, treat this virus because RNA viruses can um, mutate very quickly, um, and then the fact that it's also a going to enter the lysogenic cycle means that it will stay in the body forever. You can't get rid of it. Um, so they've had a hard time coming up with a cure for HIV because it's always mutating and then it's changing into DNA and actually becoming part of the host cells that it's infecting um, and that makes it very difficult to come up with um, vaccines and treatments for it. Okay, So the virus can reside in a host for many years without causing symptoms. So some people can have HIV for years and not know it um, because it's not until the cells start getting destroyed that you can begin to show the signs of AIDS. So this is what an HIV virus will look like. So you can see you've got your RNA on the inside. Um, and there's a special protein in there, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And so when this gets injected into the host cell, the reverse trans transcriptase goes with it, and that converts it back into DNA. And then it be can become part of the host cell. All right, so we do have a way of protecting ourselves against some of um, our different viruses and that is using vaccines. So viruses cannot be treated with antibiotics like bacterial infections. There's no special medicine that you can take that's going to kill um, most viruses. So instead we will use vaccines to protect against getting the viral infection in the first place. But the vaccines that we can take do not treat these viruses. They're only going to protect against us. So what happens is parts of the virus's capsid get injected into the patient. And that actually allows the body to mount a response and be ready to fight the real virus if it is ever exposed to it. So if you got a flu shot this year, you are actually injected with little pieces of the flu. And then if your body ever sees the real thing, it'll be ready and it will fight it off before it can make you sick. Okay. So the last bit of this is that, um, you know, the main purpose of this whole standard is to look at how a virus is not considered a living thing because it does not have um, all of the characteristics of life. So if we take a look, cells have a cell membrane, cytoplasm, various organelles. A cell is the basic unit of life. Viruses are not made of cells. They only have a piece of nucleic acid inside um, a capsid made of protein. That's it. Um, one of the characteristics of life is reproduction. Cells can reproduce independently. Um, viruses cannot. They only can do that inside of a host cell. Viruses do have a genetic code, just like all other living things, so that, that one works. It does have that characteristic. Um, they cannot grow and develop. They don't get bigger. Okay, They don't change. Um, they cannot obtain, obtain and use energy. That's why they actually have to go into a host cell. They can change over time because they are mostly DNA or RNA. They can go through mutations, and that is changing over time, so they can adapt to their environments, which is why HIV has been around for so long. Um, but they cannot respond to their environment. Once the body starts to fight, they can either, they're either going to be resistant to that or not, but they can't respond to changes in that environment. Okay, so um, when you are asked if a virus is a living thing, the number one reason why it's not considered a living thing, it is, is not made of cells, but also it cannot do many of the different characteristics of life.